eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree where have I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also unto his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and did clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words and for this opportunity to meet once again in your house tonight. God, I pray that you would please just fill me with your spirit, your power. Lord, help us all to understand. Speak to us through the Holy Ghost. God, help me to make your words plain and um, help us all just to be listen, listening and attentive and uh, that we wouldn't let the cares of this world and other events going on around us or, or going on tonight, later, um, distract us from being able to focus and, and really hear what you'd have for us to learn tonight. God, I pray to you, please just, just be with us and teach us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Genesis chapter number three. <clears throat> So let's look at verse number one of Genesis 3. The Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, um, here we see the serpent. You know, Satan is often called the serpent. He's, you know, the devil, Satan. There's a lot of names that were given to him. We see the serpent here. It was Satan making his, his appearance unto Adam and Eve in the garden, uh, specifically unto Eve. He's, he's talking, we see right here from verse number one. Um, if you remember just in, in chapter two, we, chapter one, we got the creation. We got everything being made. Chapter two kind of goes back over that a little bit with God creating Adam and, and bringing the animals for him to name and then um, making a help meet for him and Eve. And, and them being created. And then the last verse in verse, uh, verse cha of chapter 2 is, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So everything's fine. Everything's good. You have Adam and Eve. They're in the garden. They've got all these trees that they could eat the fruit from. But God just gave them one commandment. He said, okay, you can eat freely of all these trees in the garden. But that one tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you can't eat from that. 
So, verse number one of chapter three enters Satan in, and we see his his tactics and his is um, the way that he gets us to sin really hasn't changed much. And we see here he's a serpent. He he comes, and he was subtle. The Bible says he's real subtle. He doesn't make it, you know, Satan doesn't want to make things real obvious and real overtly just satanic or, or evil or wicked. He, he's very subtle about it. He's going to try to get you to sin so that you might not even be thinking it is a sin. It's a lot easier to get people to contradict God's word or to go against or to do something that God told them not to do when in their mind they're not even thinking that it's wrong or that they are, they're, they're even breaking God's laws. And this is the way that Satan deals. He tries to get people. And one of the ways he does that, we can see here in verse number one, he says, Yea, hath God said? He said, Did God really say that? And even just asking that alone is enough to get the other person just to start questioning, just to start thinking, Wait, well, I don't know. Wait, did he really say that? You know, it's, it's, it's funny when you, when you believe something or we think something and you tell someone else, when they agree with you, that, that confirmation kind of strengthens and, and, and solidifies your belief a little bit. And you could be talking to someone, maybe you're a little bit unsure about something, and they say, oh yeah, exactly, I know exactly what you're talking about, I believe the exact same thing. It kind of strengthens and, and makes your belief a little bit more solid. But when someone says, well wait, does the Bible really say that? Then it gets even you to start questioning. You know, I do this, and there's, you know, there's nothing wrong with just saying, well, is that really what it says, necessarily? But this is, this is a tactic that Satan is using just to cause doubt. Now, if, if someone causes doubt, or, or maybe even just two Christians just having a conversation, and say, well, wait, what does the Bible, you know, does the Bible really say that? Well, it's easy for us just to say, okay, well, yeah, let's find out. And then just take it for what it says. But Satan, his goal is to try to get people to question God's word. Did God really say that? And then he says, um, he says, Yea, hath God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? He's like, didn't he say you could eat of everything? And um, verse number two says, And the woman said unto the serpent, See, she knew. She said, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, we don't have that neither shall ye touch it recorded in the Bible. So, I don't know, that kind of looks like Eve's kind of adding unto it a little bit, just by saying, well, you're not supposed to eat it, and you can't even touch it. Unless God said that to her, and it's just not recorded in the Bible, um, he just said that they're not allowed to eat from that tree. But regardless, I mean, she had it in her head, just stay away from that tree. You know, which, okay, don't even touch it. Great. Just stay away from it. Right? And she knew that. And that's, she tells the serpent, no, this is what God said. Right? Verse number three says, But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Verse number four, And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. So now she starts off by saying, Well, did God really say that? And then he just comes out and flat out contradicts and says, you know, you're not, you're not really going to die. You're not surely going to die. It's not a sure thing. And Satan has been doing this for all time. He's always questioning God's word. That's why we have so many different Bible versions out there today. He's trying to cause this confusion among believers and among people who aren't saved to just question, well, what did God really say? How do I know what the truth is? By, by having this whole multitude of different versions to choose from that all say different things. Well, which one's the right word? And not only that, then contradicting God's word. And that's what all these, these modern versions are doing. They are in contradiction to God's word. They're saying different things. But um, look, at, look at what he says here in verse number 5 because now he tries to make this sin real appealing. Right? First he casts doubt. First he says, okay, did God really say that? Then he's like, well, you're not really going to die and contradicts God's word. Then look at verse number 5. He says, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So now he's trying to explain, well, look, you're not really going to die. God just told you that you're going to die because he doesn't want you eating that because if you eat that, then you're going to be like gods. Then you'll know good and evil. And, then, you know, and, and he starts to entice them 
with this lust, this covetousness for this, this knowledge that, that they weren't supposed to have, that God said he didn't want them to have. But now all of a sudden they're thinking, oh, well, we can be gods. You know, we can be like the gods. And this is, um, you know, knowing good and evil, having this knowledge. This is the, the, the pitch that Satan gives to him. And this is actually still going on today. It's called Luciferianism. It's, it's people who worship Lucifer. Now that word, the name Lucifer, it actually comes from the root word of luz, which, which means light. And you only find out who Lucifer is from reading the King James Bible, by the way. None of the other versions, the modern versions, do not have that name Lucifer. They've all removed it into being the morning star, which is the name of Jesus Christ. But in the King James Bible, it says, you know, oh, Lucifer, son of the morning. And that name, the meaning of the name Lucifer is tied in with light. That's why he says son of the morning. You know, the morning we have the light. And, and that name um, Lucifer comes from light. And what people today, there are, there are religions and cults out there that don't see Lucifer as evil or as bad or as wicked or as wrong. They see him as someone who's, hey, he's trying to help. He was trying to help Adam and Eve here. He's trying to give them knowledge. He's trying to, yeah, he's trying to enlighten them. He's trying to give them this light, this, this understanding and knowing good and evil. And, know, you know, and, and people say, well, what could be wrong with that? We, you know, because we, especially we live in a, in a society that tries to um, emphasize knowledge, but it's the world's knowledge. Now, I'm, now I'm not against knowledge. So don't, don't mistake what I'm saying here. But they have this emphasis where, where in many, with, with some, in some cases, that knowledge becomes their religion and becomes their God. And like, that's what they're focused on is just this, this knowing. And these people become these career students all the time and they're always in the universities and they're just wor learning the, the wisdom of this world. They're not necessarily learning any truths. Maybe there's some truth in there, but, but they're just learning the wisdom of this world. And they have this, this pedestal lifted up. But um, not even talking about that, but these, these religions where people literally will worship and... and believe Lucifer was a good person, and you think about the Illuminati, or you hear about the Illuminati and these, these secret societies and things, they're Luciferian. They think that Satan was good, and they'll actually read the Bible, but they don't, they don't see it as, as he was being, he's a, he's a wicked devil, you know, as God would say. They're trying to say, oh, no, no, he's just trying to help us out. He was trying to help us out from this oppressive God of the Bible. And, um, now, when you, when you hear something as being satanic, just any person in general, if someone were to say, that's satanic, you're going to have probably a negative response to that. You're going to be thinking, wow, that must be really bad. That was probably your first instinct, your natural reaction when someone says, this is just completely satanic. Probably 99% of the people in America today would be like, well, then that must be really bad. They're associating something that's satanic with something that's really bad, right? I mean, it kind of makes sense. But, and, and that's rightly so. But there are many things out there that truly are satanic. In the truest sense, because of what, it, what would satanic mean? It means it's of Satan. It would be of the devil, right? It comes from Satan. There's many things out there that truly are satanic, but they don't get that, that label of satanic. They get other labels, so they tend to get blown off and, and people don't think they're that big of a deal. Or, um, you know, people think that they're supposed to be tolerated or accepted in our politically correct world today. Um, look at what the serpent was telling Eve. He was telling her that she would increase her knowledge and be as gods, right? That they would be as the gods. And there are many people today that are trying to teach the same exact thing. Now, if someone is trying to teach the same thing that, that Satan was doing here, wouldn't you say that's satanic? So anybody today that believes that, hey, you can be like the gods and they're going to tell other people so, that must be satanic. But why doesn't the world today say that Mormonism is satanic? Today it's become so accepted into our society. It used to be viewed as a cult. And that, that name is just kind of like, people don't view it that way anymore. It's been pushed through media and everything else. 
to the point to where you know we could have a, a person one of the front runners running for president that is a mormon that is a part of this cult that subscribes to this cultish satanic religion yes it is satanic and as people say oh no 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 they're christian and as we try to say no we're christian we're just like you no you're of the devil you're satanic what you believe is satanic because you believe that you will one day become your own god that's exactly what the devil was telling Eve. Say, hey, eat of this fruit, you'll be like the gods. Hey, join our church, you'll be a god one day. That's satanic, my friends. That's exactly what Satan was telling Eve. There's other cults out there, too, that, that believe almost the same exact thing. People who don't even have anything to do with Christianity, like these transhumanists, people who want to merge, you know, humans with machines and try to get their eternal life that way somehow by downloading their brain and there's all there's all kinds of crazy stuff out there today and they're all wicked and satanic people trying to come up with their own ways to to get eternal life or or to become gods but this is what the what these luciferians and illuminatis are all about they're all about becoming your own gods and about gaining this enlightenment as if it's a good thing when God commanded that they shouldn't do that and that he didn't want them to do that. But Satan always wants to package wickedness in a way so that you don't have the immediate opposition to it. Right? So like when I was, if I were to say, if, if people were just to commonly be saying Mormonism is satanic, right? Most people would just stay away as far as possible from that because you hear enough people saying, that's satanic. That's of the devil. But when things aren't, don't have that type of a label, even though they really fit the label, you're a lot more likely to get sucked into it and to allow it in and to even allow it as a valid choice, as a valid option. When nobody is calling sin out and calling this wickedness out as being satanic as it really is, it's, it, it, you don't have that instant you know, bad response to it as you ought to with anything. See, when, when, when someone says something satanic, you, like, I don't know about you, but most people probably have this type of an image. They're thinking like, you know, the devil with the horns and the pitchfork and like upside down pentagrams and, and blood sacrifice and all these other weird things that are satanic because those are overtly just completely wicked um, um, horrible things that, that are, so, and rightly so, are associated with things that are satanic because people think of like the satanic church and you know, all these, these different um, satanists throughout history that have, that have gotten caught with their you know, human sacrifices and animal sacrifices, all these other things that they do. And yeah, that's really weird and bad and, and they're hedonists and, and they believe in, in just, well, you know, do what, do what you want to do and that's the law and um, you know, all, all this other just total wickedness. But there's a lot more than just that that's satanic. And in truth, <laughs> even though that stuff is satanic, that's not where, where Satan does his worst work because he's subtle. He's going to try to make things seem good. That's why you have all these different you know, false religions that, that will be called Christianity. God, Satan wants you to think that what you're doing is right, what you're doing is good. He doesn't want you to, to just, he doesn't want to come out and just have his big label like, come to the church of Satan. No, he's going to call it the church of God. He's going to call it the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Right? That sounds like a good name. Come to the church of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> But let's keep reading here, because that's the way the devil operates. Verse number six says, um, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig, le fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, you know, again, Satan always tries to make sin look so attractive and alluring. And all he had to do with Eve, he planted the thoughts into her mind. 
First, he questioned God's word. Then he said, well, wait, that's, that's, that's not really true, what God said. And then he lifted up this, this projected this image of that fruit and how good it really is going to be for her. And just in doing those things, Eve did the rest. Eve, Eve committed sin. She, she did the transition. She was fooled and deceived by the devil. But instead of relying on, no, God's not going to lie to me. God's going to tell me the truth and sticking close to what he said, she was able to get deceived into this sin. And all sin, when you get deceived, it's a, it's a deception. Satan projects one thing. But in reality, it's another. Now, did they, know, did they learn the knowledge of good and evil? Yeah, and then what's the first thing that happens? They go, oh, we're naked. Right? And then they have to, to sew fig leaves together, try to cover their nakedness and everything else. So they, they get this knowledge, but it's not all it's cracked up to be. Now all of a sudden, oh, now I'm naked, and then we're going to go through the curses in a little bit that they receive as a result of their disobedience. It's never worth the price that, that you have to pay when you commit these sins. See, Satan tried to make it look all great. Oh, you're going to be like God. And were they like gods? No. They knew good and evil, but they're still flesh. They're still human beings. They're not, they're not gods. Okay? Satan's the liar. Satan's the deceiver. But it's interesting that she started thinking about what he said, what he told her, and then looked on that tree and all of a sudden, instead of, instead of looking at that tree as, that's the tree that God said I, I should not be eating, not even touching. That's the way she used to look at it. But after talking to Satan, now she's looking at it, oh, well, it is a pretty good tree. Hey, the, the fruit, it's ripe. That looks like it would even taste really good. Now she's looking at it, she's viewing it differently because she's allowed Satan to, to get into her mind and, and to corrupt her and pervert the way that, that she ought to be thinking about things. And we need to have that proper view of sin in our lives. When we see God's commandments, we see God's laws, it ought to be in our minds like, there is no way we should ever do these things. And we need to look at it as if, as if it's of the devil, it's satanic if you do go out and do these things. Because Satan's the one that's going to try to get you to disobey God's word. Instead of looking at it with compassion and saying, oh yeah, well, it's not that bad and making excuses and everything else or justifying your own sins. Anytime you're, you're going against what God told you to do or what God told you not to do, either way, it's satanic. And you shouldn't be doing that. And we need to have this proper view so that we wouldn't even come close to committing these sins and not allow ourselves, our minds to be polluted by Satan, by the satanic influences of the world, by the media, by, by everything that's going on in the world today to, to desensitize you or to get you to look at sin in a different light, in a positive light. And, you know, looking at the, the, the fornication and the adultery and the, you know, alcohol and just, just you know, the world's going to tell you, Satan's going to try to tell you, this is all good. Oh, God didn't really say that. Oh, look, Jesus made turn water into wine. And that's what they'll do. They'll use it. They'll, they'll try to say it's in the Bible. Wine, yeah, it's good to have wine. God didn't really say that, that not to look on it. He didn't say that. Yes, he did, but that's what the devil's going to try to do. And the more you allow that to, to come into your brain, it's going to influence you. And um, so, one, be careful who you keep company with and, and just in general, you know, having, having these long conversations with. But um, we need to just make sure no matter what that we're founded in God's word and that we wouldn't be strayed as easily as Eve was to just be able to say, no, I know what God said and to be able to withstand those attacks from the devil because they're going to come and you can never just completely prevent it unless you just lived all by yourself somewhere and had no communication with anyone which is not what we're supposed to do anyways um, we're going to be talking with people we're going to have communication we live in this world There's, we're getting pounded with this stuff all the time but we need to make sure we have the proper view of sin and that Satan's not going to be able to trick us and deceive us and I also like the I don't like it but it's interesting when you see 
Adam and Eve's feeble attempt that they made to cover themselves. When they found out that they're, that they're naked, they make these aprons, just a little apron of fig leaves, right? And I believe that's symbolic of basically the best that we have. That's, that's the best that human beings can offer to try to cover themselves, to cover their sin, to cover their nakedness, to cover their shame, is just this little, little apron of, of fig leaves. And that's, that's about as good as we have it. That's about as, the best we can do. But God's way is much more complete to take care of that. Jump down to verse 21 real quick. Verse 21 of Genesis 3 says, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. So he says, get rid of these stupid aprons. <laughs> they don't work, okay? You're not fooling anybody. You're not doing a very good job of covering yourself. Here, I've made you this coat of a skin of an animal. That's going to, you know, you got a nice leather coat to, to cover yourself with. That will cover you. And you think of going back now to what I was talking about with Genesis chapter 2. What was the punishment for eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? is death, right? And we kind of went over this. I, I, I spend a, quite a bit of time going into the fact that we have three parts, body, soul, and spirit. And when they, when they broke the commandment, they didn't physically just drop dead on the spot when they, when they ate of that fruit, did they? No, they, they, but they did die. God commanded, and, and that was his punishment. He says, you're going to die. They spiritually died when they disobeyed God's commandment, when they sinned. And it's no different for us today. When, when, when we sin, we spiritually died. But we see the foreshadowing of a Savior right in this verse, in verse number 21, with Adam and Eve being clothed with skins. Because in order for God to cover them with the skin of an animal, the blood needed to be shed for that animal. And a sacrifice had to be made in order to, to cover up the sins of Adam and Eve. That blood had to be shed. And Jesus Christ, as Jesus Christ would one day be the lamb slain from the foundation of the world for his blood to cover them and to give them that they might be clothed upon. And... Um, to cover their shame and their nakedness. And, and we see that right from, right from Genesis chapter 3. It's, a, it's an illustration, it's a picture of that gospel of, of the blood of Jesus Christ to come and to take away the sins of the whole world. And um, let's, But let's keep reading here. Let's go back to verse number 8. The Bible says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. And this is another common reaction to sinning. When, you, when you're involved in sin, you know you've done wrong. You know, the first thing was they're trying to cover it up. Right? They try to cover it up with their aprons. And then they try to hide themselves from God. Because they're ashamed. I mean, I can understand it. When you do something bad, when you do something wrong, or when you do something wrong to someone else, oftentimes you try to avoid that person. Right? You're ashamed. You, you feel guilty. I don't, I don't even want to see that person. When you've done wrong to them, right? You, don't want to, you, you just kind of want to avoid it. Well, that's what they're doing from God. But the thing is, once you, when you do wrong against God, you can't run away from God. You can't hide from God. It's kind of a silly thing to try to do. Even though I can understand the reaction, which is very common when we sin, but... The Bible says in Jeremiah 23, 23, says, Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord. God's like, I fill heaven and earth. You can't contain me. You can't hide from me. You know, you can't hide under your covers in your bed, and I'm not going to know you're there. Right? You, can't, you can't run away to some other country or, or dig a pit or dig into the, wall, the side of a mountain and I'm not going to see you. You can't go to the bottom of the ocean. It's like, I'm there. You can't get away from God. There is no hiding from God. Now, um, in verse number 9 of Genesis 3, it says, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, where have I commanded thee, that thou shouldest not eat? Now, did God really need Adam to tell him where he was, or who told him he was naked? Of course not. God already knows the answers to these questions. But this is how God deals with us sometimes as human beings. Obviously, God knew the answer, but... Um, and this is actually, I mean, it's the same way that I deal with my children sometimes, right? I could, 
I could know what has happened. Our kids do something wrong, they disobeyed, they, um, you know, they made a big mess or whatever. And not always, but sometimes I know, I know who did it and I know, I know what happened. But you ask the question anyways, because there's a reason for it. You're making a point, right? Um, God's making a point and he's, and he's asking, wait a minute, you know, who told you we were naked? And um, he needs it. He wants them to fess up. And, and that's part of, the, part of the getting right with God is confessing and forsaking our sins. So he's given them this opportunity to say, okay, God, we did wrong. We've, you know, so that they can get right with God again. And um, that's oftentimes the reason why I, um, I'll ask my children because I want them to tell me so that they could just fully understand I've done wrong. They need to be able to actually say it because you try to hide as much as possible because you don't want to just come out and say it. But it's an important part of getting right again of being able to admit that you've done wrong. Just like with salvation, I mean, we need to be able to get to the point where we could admit, I'm a sinner. We have to get to the point where we could admit, I can't go to heaven on my own. I'm not as good as I think I am. I need a Savior. I deserve hell. We need to get to that point before God would save us. And, and with any type of getting right or healing, we need to be able to get to that point. And God does the same thing here. What's kind of funny, though, is that I've actually heard recently someone say that um, there's all kinds of crazy beliefs out there about where we came from. I believe the Bible. I believe that mankind spawned on this earth from Adam and Eve. I don't believe that God made all kinds of different people and then the, you know, the, that the whole earth was, was spread from all these different people. I believe what the Bible says about Adam and Eve, that, they, that Eve was the mother of all living. I'm going to get to that in just a second. But um, that the whole earth was overspread. But one of the proofs that these people will say that, oh no, it's not just Adam and Eve because God asked them, who told thee that thou wast naked? So they make this assumption, well, if God's saying who told thee, then there must have been other people walking around in order to tell him for God to even ask that question. Well, it's stupid because they're making a false assumption. First of all, we already saw from this story that the serpent was able to speak. Right? So right away, we know that the serpent is able to speak. So just because the serpent's able to speak doesn't mean there's other human beings walking around. If he's asking who, he could have been referring to the serpent. The serpent might have said something to him, right? I mean, it could, it could have been anything else, but it doesn't necessarily imply that there has to be other people walking around. And like I said, God already knew the answer. He didn't need him to tell him, but um, he was making a point out of that. But that's one of their proofs, and um, I think that's just pretty silly that, that they'll even use that as a, as a proof that there must have been other humans around. But... Um, because you, you just you can't get that from, from that verse. Look at verse number 12. It says, The man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Now here we see another common reaction when confronted with our sin, the blame game. Right? All right, Adam. You know, who told you you're naked? Well, um, he's like, Did you eat of the tree? Well, you know, the, the woman... You, you gave me the woman, God. This woman that you gave me? Yeah. She gave me of the tree and I did eat. And then when God talks to the woman, the woman says, you know, what have you done? And the woman says, well, the, the serpent, the serpent tricked me. He beguiled me. And I did eat. And that's, that's and you know, this is, this is again, it's common. When, when we're confronted with our sin, you don't want to own up and just take ownership and say, yeah, I've done wrong. It's really easy to just start blaming other people and start trying to push the blame off yourself as much as possible. But, you know, we really ought not to do that. We ought to just confess and, and, and forsake it, like I said. But, um, so Adam blamed, blames Eve, Eve blames the serpent, but God holds them all responsible. So don't ever forget that. You could say, well, you know, Eve was tricked. 
She's still responsible. She knew God's word. She went against it. Yeah, she was tricked. She was told lies. But God still held her responsible. Adam was held responsible. And the, 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 the serpent was held responsible too. You say, well, the serpent didn't even eat of the fruit. Yeah, but he was the one that caused Eve to do it. God cursed all three of them. And, um, you know, be careful with... with <laughs> um, I mean, I want to say be careful, but it just seems so far-fetched that anyone would in, in here would be like trying to get other people to commit sin. Obviously, though, don't ever do that because you'll be held responsible just as much as anyone else. And, and don't, don't think that you're innocent when you do commit sin just because someone else might have tricked you. Because you're not. You have your own sin as well. Um, Let's look at some of these curses. At verse number 14 says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So the, the curse on the serpent. Now, we don't know exactly what the serpent necessarily looked like prior to this, but something changed to the point to where now, I mean, you see snakes all the time. What do they do? They crawl around on their belly. Right, that's what they do. Um, the serpent didn't always do that. Whether he had legs or arms or just was able to, I, I don't know. And I'm not going to claim to know. And people have debates and arguments about this and stuff. And I think it just that's another silly thing. We don't know, but we do know that the curse was that that, that serpent is going to crawl around his belly um, and eat dust. And then verse 15 says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now there's a lot of symbolism involved with these curses, especially with the serpent and, and understanding that the serpent is representing Satan. There is Satan in the garden here. And, um, but quite literally, there is still this curse of the serpent. Elizabeth, stop doing that. There is this curse upon the serpent. We're going to see this curse as well on, um, on the man and the woman. Look at verse number 16. He says, Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow sh thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So now we see the curse that was given unto the woman. He says, I'm going to multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. So, and he, said, he goes on further to say, In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children. So prior to this, again, we don't know exactly what the plan was for, for reproduction, if there was, you know, whatever God's plan was. But because of this sin, God says, okay, now in sorrow you're going to bring forth children. And it is. Any woman who's had children before, it's not, <laughs> it's not the, the happiest of occasions while you're bringing forth the child. Afterward, yeah, there's joy because a man is brought forth into the world and it's great and, and, and obviously we love it and we love having kids, but that, that process of bearing the child, carrying the child and bearing it, it's sorrowful. It's painful. There's a lot, there's a lot of, of pain and agony and grief that, go, that a woman goes through just in order to bring a child into this world. This is one of the curses that God has placed on a woman because of Eve's sin. This is, this is what has been brought down. But the other one is, it says, And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So at this point, and turn if you would, keep your finger in Genesis 3, turn if you would to 1 Timothy chapter 2, because we're going to look at this a little bit further. God made it so that women will, their desire will be to their husband. And now you have a lot of feminazis today that they'll, they'll try to tell you, oh no, you know, women need to be independent and, and man and woman are, are equal and that, that there should be no authority in the house and that, you know, whatever, that, that they go against basically what the Bible says. But they're also going against nature. Because naturally speaking, God made it. Right here in this curse, God made it. He says, your desire shall be to thy husband. So God is influencing the desire of a woman for her desire to be to her husband. And that's, I think it's pretty obvious when you look in general 
at the population, women follow their husbands. The husband is the breadwinner. The husband goes out and, and is the man generally is the one with the, with the, that's a strong leader. And women are generally followers and, and, and looking for a strong man and someone who's able to make those strong decisions and, 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 um, and follow a person like that. It's just something that's kind of in our nature, in human nature, as a woman to, for a desire to be the husband. But then it says, and he shall rule over thee. So God's saying right here, I mean, it may be one of her curses, but he says, your, your desire is going to be to him and he's going to rule over you now. And that's, that's the way it is. And this is the way it is today. But look at ver, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. We're going to apply this also within the church because um, it all ties together. Ver, 1 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse number 9. It says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Verse number 11. He says, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, he says, and then he goes on in verse 13, for Adam was first formed, then Eve. He's explaining why. Verses 11 and 12, he's saying, okay, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, meaning she's, she's under someone else's authority, being in silence with subjection, and they're not allowed to teach. I just suffer not a woman to teach or to usurp authority over the man, which means to take that authority that the man has been given and just basically override that authority and, and become an authority over the man. He says, no, but they're to be in silence. And he explains why. And the reason why is found in verses 13 and 14. He says, because Adam was first formed, then Eve. Verse number 14, and Adam was not deceived but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So he explains the reason why women are not teachers in the church. The reason why women need to learn in silence is because all the way back to Adam and Eve. He says this goes all the way back to the beginning. The reason why is because Adam wasn't deceived. When Adam took of that fruit and ate it, it's not because the devil tricked him into thinking, oh, you're going to be like gods or anything like that. That's not why he took it. That's why Eve took it. That's why Eve sinned. But then it says Eve just brought it to Adam and Adam had eaten. Now, we don't necessarily know the motivation for Adam doing it. There's a lot of things you could think of, you know, out of love for his wife. Hey, he knows now that she just sinned and she's going to be facing this, this punishment and he loved her. Maybe he was kind of getting himself involved for her sake. We don't know. I can't speculate for sure on what his motivations were, but the Bible says that he wasn't tricked. Okay, he, he sinned, yes, and it was wrong, and, and we're going to get into his curse in just a minute. But he wasn't tricked. He wasn't deceived. So what, what he's explaining here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, you can flip back to Genesis 3, is that you know, women aren't allowed to teach because I think it's easier for a woman to be deceived to be tricked by the devil. That's why the husband and the man has been ordained by God to be the, the, the leader in the household, the spiritual leader. And that's why pastors are men and not women. That's why the teachers in the church are men because it's not as easy for a man to be tricked or deceived. And you, you can disagree with me. You can, you can hate me for or whatever, but that, this is what the Bible's saying. That's what the Bible is saying in 1 Timothy 2 because first it gives the rule of women not being allowed to speak and then he's saying he's explaining why. And it goes back to what we're reading here in Genesis chapter 3. It goes all the way back to that curse. The woman was deceived. Now, um, again, God made man and women different. And just because it's easier for a woman to be deceived doesn't mean that they're worse of a person or, or anything like that. But... That also, you know, but it does mean that there's certain jobs that aren't appropriate for a woman. You know, men and women both have their strengths and their weaknesses. And we ought to be following the proper roles based on our strengths and weaknesses that God gave us. A woman's strength is, I mean, by far, and I know this for a fact, with raising the children and being able to do a hundred things at one time and keeping anything, everything under control here because I just think about sometimes if my, if my role was, was reversed with my wife, 
I'd go nuts. Like she, she does a very good job of keeping our house and keeping the kids and doing all these different things. And, and I mean, there's just so much of what she does. She is way more equipped and way more suited to do the job that she has to do. But I'll tell you what, I'm way more equipped and way more suited to the job that I have to do with making the money and doing the work and doing the hard work and, and you know, tilling the ground or doing whatever it is that some of the things that I have to do, some of my job, I'm much better equipped for that than she is. But it's because God made us different. And that's the bottom line. And, and we just have to understand that and try to, to, to live in our God-given roles and just accept it for what it is. But let's look at, let's look at Adam's um, curse now in verse number 17 of Genesis 3. It says, and, Adam, and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So he's saying, okay, Adam, you, know, you had it real nice in here. I had this nice garden for you. Everything was well kept. You had the mist coming out. All you had to do was just keep it. You got all this fruit growing. And, and you didn't really have to do much of anything for it. But now, because you listen to your wife, he says, now you're going to work. And you're going to basically work your fingers to the bone. And you're going to work until the day you die. He says, there's no retirement plan for you, Adam. You're going you're gonna to work in the sweat of thy face. He says, this is not going to be easy. You're going to have to work hard to, to provide that food in order to, to, for you, to feed yourself and to feed your family. He says, all the way until you return unto the ground where you're formed. And um, man is commanded here, and, and it's our job to work in order to provide the food for the family. And um, just like the woman is, is going to bring forth the children and, and her desire is going to be to her husband and he shall rule over thee. Well, the man now, we got to work. And we got to work a lot. And we got to work until the day we die. That's what, that's what the Bible's saying here. This was the curse brought on Adam. Now, I want to jump back real quick here because um, there's a certain doctrine that I've been toying around with, with preaching an entire sermon against. But I don't think it's worthy of an entire sermon because it's a really silly doctrine. But it's out there. And not only is it just on the internet, because there's all kinds of crazy stuff on the internet. I'm not going to be preaching against every single false, crazy heresy that's on the internet. But I actually ran into a person that believed this. Out soul winning. So I'm going to... And it's not... Especially because of the internet these days... Weird doctrines can spread and grow really fast. You think of like the Hebrew Roots Movement, like that was almost non-existent not that long ago and now it's like this big thing online because you know people get sucked into this weird stuff. But what the, the, the false doctrine or the false belief that I'm going to be preaching against is it's called serpent seed. Okay, look at you would at Genesis 3 verse 15. This is one of the, this is the curse to the serpent. Okay? He says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And um, <laughs> just to explain what, what they believe, real, I'll try to do it real briefly. They believe that there's a lot more symbolism going on here with the fruit and the tree. And they believe that the Satan, that, that the serpent laid with Eve and that the seed was produced because the, what, one of the things they'll say is that her seed, so like talking about woman, the woman doesn't have a seed, the man has a seed. So they're saying that, um, I don't even know exactly what, why they bring that up, but obviously I, you know, a seed is talking about descendants. That's pretty apparent from the, from the context here. But, um, what they say is that there's going to be enmity between thy seed and her seed. So when they say between thy seed, it's talking about this, this serpent seed, like literal seed 
of her being impregnated and bringing forth a child. And they said that was Cain. And then the man's seed, like, like Adam and Eve's seed, would be her seed, which would be um, Abel, right, and Seth. And they say that, so like, um, that there's this enmity now because you have these people who are really wicked that are, that are of the serpent seed and these other people who aren't as wicked that are, are, that are more righteous that are of you know, Adam's seed and of, of the, the right seed. And it's really bizarre. It, it is. I mean, it's just how you can read Genesis 3 and, and come up with that. But the Genesis 3.15 is like, this is like one of their strongest verses. See, it says the serpent seed right there. And, it, you know, and they come up with this whole crazy nonsense. And this is also the foundation, not in everyone that believes this, but, but for like a lot of the racism that goes on. Because people, and you hear the variations of this, where some people will say, oh yeah, black people, they were of Cain. You know, and they'll think that when God set a mark upon Cain, that that mark is that he was black. And I mean, there's, there's so much ridiculousness out there, but it's kind of a justification so people can look at other people as less than human or as, as just by nature, you know, children of the serpent or children of the devil. Now, very easily, turn if you would to John chapter 8. And they'll also use, you know, like in 1 John 3.12, it says, Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. So in 1 John 3.12, it says that Cain was of that wicked one. It means he was from that wicked one, right? And, see, we have no problem with that saying that. It doesn't mean that he was literally, physically, a child of the wicked one but it means he was spiritually a child of that wicked one. The same way that we need to be born again, we become children of God. You know, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. We are spiritually born into God's family and we're spiritually become his child or his children the same way that people can spiritually become a child of the devil. Very easy to understand that concept, and it makes sense with all of Scripture. But they turn to this and they say, nope, that just has to be. It's funny because they'll say, well, we believe the Bible literally. And, but then everything else is just an allegory, right? Like the, the, the fruit and all this other stuff that happens. Oh, yeah, well, that's just all an allegory to, to this act that supposedly, this bestiality supposedly that Eve had with, with the serpent or whatever. You know, like it's... it's ridiculous. Which is funny too because they'll say that, that that's figurative of the fruit and, and Eve, you know, taking that fruit. But then what about when Eve gave Adam the fruit? What did he do? <laughs> you know, are you gonna, th they don't like to apply the allegory that way then. Then all of a sudden it's like something different. I don't know. Um, but John chapter 8, look at verse number 39. It says, They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Here we have an example of Jesus Christ saying, you know, saying unto people that, you're of your father, the devil. But these people he's talking to, they were physical descendants of Abraham. They were physical Jews. Like they, they had the genealogy to prove they were of that lineage, right? But what he's saying is that you're not a child of Abraham. You're not a child of God. Because I can tell because, you know, you, you would do the works then of Abraham. You would, you would be like him. And he's talking about them being spiritually children of God or children of Abraham because Abraham did these good things. And um, they, they can't get their, their mind wrapped around this because they're like, well, we're not born of fornication. 
You know, we have our lineage. We have one father, even God. And see, even just here, you see, you see at first they claim Abraham's their father, then they claim God as their father. The same way that I could claim that physically speaking, I have a descendancy and I have these fathers and I, I don't know anyone going back that far to name a name, but let's just say someone in my lineage was named Abraham and I could say, well, I have Abraham to my father, but then I could also say I have God to my father because I do, because I'm born again. God is my father. And if you're, if you're born again, you do too. And um, there'd be nothing wrong with that because there's a physical and a spiritual birth. And that's what these people don't understand, that, that buy into this serpent seed doctrine. But um, let's go back to Genesis 3.13. There's one other point about this doctrine I want to point out. And I'm, like I said, because I don't want to spend, there's, there's a lot of points and a lot of issues and a lot of ways you could prove this wrong up and down throughout the Bible. But um, the, the reason why I bring this up is because between all the variations, they all go back to this same thing. And the guy that I even talked to out soul winning said this very, because I actually went into his house and like sat down with him because I was trying to get him saved. And he started asking me all these weird questions about this stuff. And um, he brought this up. And that was the first I had heard of it. But look at verse number 13 of Genesis 3. It says, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Now, does anyone here have a problem understanding that word beguiled? Because I don't. The word beguiled in English it just means he tricked her, right? Makes sense. He deceived her, he tricked her, he beguiled her. Well, when I looked up the serpent seed doctrine on Wikipedia, and again, this was, this was also validated by the, by the person I had talked to in person. Um, basically, everything I've been able to find of people that, that subscribe to this heresy, uh, I'm going to read from you what it says on, in Wikipedia. It says, the chapter states that the serpent beguiled Eve, and it has beguiled in quotes. In early modern English, this word literally meant to seduce or lead astray. So they're saying that word beguiled means to seduce. And when I was talking to that guy, he says, well, the Strong's Dictionary, that tells me, you know, that word means that he seduced her. It doesn't just mean that he tricked her, he beguiled her. Now, in Wikipedia, they had a footnote for the reference that made that claim that it literally meant to seduce. And here are the definitions. I followed that link. And it took me to um, the Electronic Middle English Dictionary. Okay? So I went to that link to where, where it gives you the definition of beguiled. Definition number 1A, to deceive or delude. That's what I'm saying beguiled means, to deceive or delude. B, be false to betray, um, to defraud, cheat, to deprive of what is due or expected, disappoint. That's, verse, that's, that's definition number one. Number two, to get the better of or dupe, beguile. Okay. Number three, to mislead, lead astray or into error or sin. Okay. Still no problem with those definitions of the word beguiled. Be deceptive to the eye. And then it says in 3B, to seduce a woman or to lure. And then four is the time to while away time to affect insidiously. So they make this claim and it says, well, the word literally meant to seduce or lead astray. That's like definition 3B. That's not the, 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 the primary or secondary definition of that word. They're saying, well, literally meant to seduce. That's some obscure definition of the word that, yes, in a certain context, you can, you can probably use that word beguile as another word for seduce if by context it made sense. But normally speaking, that word beguile means you tricked somebody. Because in a way, seducing someone is you're tricking them to do something with you. But that is not the normal usage or definition of that word. Yet they'll claim, oh yeah, that's what that word literally meant. And that guy that I talked to at Soul Winning, he says, well, Strong's Dictionary says that that's, you know, that this Hebrew word, that word beguile. And, and that's what they, these people like to do. They're, they're Bible correctors. They're saying, well, the word that's used there isn't really, you know, in Hebrew, it really means something different. That word beguile, you know, that's not really beguiled. And they'll try to pronounce what the Hebrew word was. What that really means is seduce. So see, we see here when, when the serpent beguiled Eve, 
It means he seduced her. And, that, and that's where they come up with this crazy doctrine. But um, even in Strong's Dictionary, then, because I had this guy turn to it when I was there, I said, well, let me see that. And it says, a primitive root to lead astray, that is mentally, to delude, or morally to seduce. So again, the very last definition is seduce. But the first ones are to lead astray, to delude, right? You're, you're, you're tricking someone, you're deceiving them. Oh, and maybe it could mean seduce. So there's, oh yeah, see look, this third definition, that must be what it means in the Bible. Because they have these crazy doctrines that they want to promote or you know, they're, maybe they're trying to read something into the Bible that just simply isn't there. And this is exactly why I don't read the stupid commentaries and this is why I don't go back to the Greek or go back to the Hebrew to try to get some extra understanding of what it really means or what it really says because then you're just going to be relying on a dictionary for a language that you don't even know to teach you what the Bible says when you have it in English. And in English it's very clear. The serpent beguiled Eve. He tricked her. He tricked her. How did he trick her? Well, we already saw because he says, you're going to be like gods. Hey, eat it. you really think that she's going to believe, hey, if you lay down with me and have intercourse, you're going to be like a god? And he says, you, ye. He says, ye. So like, both, not just her. How in the world is he tricking her to think that Adam will also be like a god if she lies with him? People are so stupid sometimes with these doctrines. And like I said, I, I, there's a lot of information out there about this, and there's people that believe it and post sermons and all this other stuff about this, which is kind of why I wanted to go against it, but it's so silly and so stupid that I didn't think it was worthy of an entire, entire sermon. But I wanted to go over it a little bit because we're in Genesis chapter 3. Now, Genesis 3.20 says, And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. All living. So that right there disproves that there was all these other people around besides Adam and Eve. No, there couldn't have been because Eve was the mother of all living. And they'll say, oh yeah, see if she's the mother of all living, then she was also the mother of these people who are the ch children of the devil or the children of Cain or ch you know, whatever. And um, one other point I want to point out with Cain specifically because in chapter 4, and, and I don't know why, I don't know why people, any rational person can, can hold to this. Um, turn if you would to Genesis chapter 4 real quick. Verse number 1, it explains so clearly. It says, and Adam knew Eve, his wife. Now that word knew, and you could look it up, do a study on your, on your own of that word know, to know someone or to know them. The Bible isn't graphic when it talks about the, the relations between a, a husband and a wife. So it'll use words like to know or knew them, just like the, the Sodomites in the land of Sodom said unto Lot, you know, bring forth those men that we may know them. They're talking about defiling them sexually. Well, here it's the same, the same, the same usage of the word. And Adam knew his, Eve, his wife, so they came together and they became one flesh. And she conceived and bare Cain. What in the world would make you think that that had anything to do of the serpent when it says, right clearly in that verse, Adam and Eve, they came together, he knew her, she conceived, and Cain was born. Like that is the, the sequence of events. Yet these people still say, no, 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 that was from the serpent. Because he beguiled Eve. <laughs> How stupid can you be? The Bible clearly says in chapter 4, verse 1, that Cain came directly as a result of the conception of Adam and Eve when, he, when Adam knew his wife. It's, it's ridiculous. But, um, you know, they were the, Adam and Eve were the first people and from them spawned the whole world. And see, these people have a hard, hard time grasping and understanding. They'll say, they'll look around and say like, well, why do we have, we have Asians and, and blacks and, um, you know, Hispanics and whatever, all these different types of people, right? And we're all different colors. You have people really, really dark and really, really light and everything in between. And people with different complexion and, and hair and, and, you know, whatever. All, all these different characteristics, you know what they are. And they'll say, well, how could that all come from two people? So their lack of understanding of how that can happen, what they do then is in order to reconcile that, they just start coming up with bizarre theories. And start saying, well, there must have just been, God must have just created a whole bunch of other people on the earth. And then they have to deny the Bible and say, well, no, when the flood happened, then um, 
you know, not everybody was really killed, even though the Bible says that everything that had breath in it died in the, in the flood, except for those that were on the ark. And those that were on the ark were, were Noah's family, his sons and their wives. So, um, which really isn't much different than Adam and Eve starting everything. They restarted all of the, the human population on this earth was from, the, from um, descendants literally of, of Noah. But, um, you know, people don't, just can't comprehend. They don't know the science behind it. They don't know um, how it's possible that you can have these different races today. But um, I just believe the Bible. I believe it for what it says. And it says that, Adam, that Eve was the mother of all living. And that's why Adam called her that. But let's, um, let's finish up real quick. We're, we're, we're going to wrap up. We've got a few verses left. Verse 22. Genesis chapter 3 says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. And this is real interesting. There's only a few places in the Bible that, that do this where it just kind of stops. The sentence just, it, it's an abrupt stop. And he doesn't finish the thought. He just says, unless, you know, unless, um, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the, the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Um, there's, a, there's a section where Moses does the same thing. And um, where he's interceding for the people, where he says, and if not, and then just kind of like stops, and there's just like this dash. And um, so I just think that's kind of interesting. But I don't want to get, there's, there's a whole lot we could probably get into with this, where he says, behold, the man has become as one of us, because people will, will think, oh, see, he's automatically, they automatically assume that God is talking about the angels, because he says us, to know good and evil and all this other stuff. I don't believe that. I believe that, that that us is the same us that, that he's referring to in Genesis chapter 1 when he said, um, let us make man in our image. And in the image of God created he man. And um, it's the Trinity. It's the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. He's saying, you know, um, behold, the man has become as one of us um, to know good and evil. In the way, he's become of us in this way to know good and evil. Right? That's what he's saying. In this sense, he knows good and evil. So now, he could easily just live forever if he takes of the fruit. But he sinned, so the, the, the way, the path of salvation wasn't as simple now to just eat that tree of the, you know, eat that fruit in the garden that was physically, literally there. He's, he's saying, now we got to kick him out. Because he sinned and salvation is coming a different way and his eternal life and he's got to live with the, the consequences of his sin here. And then he says, therefore, so for this reason, so that, so that he can't put forth his hand and take of the tree of life, that's why God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So he guards the tree of life and he says, you're not coming back in here. And he sets up some cherubim, some angels to, 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 be, to take guard and a flaming sword to make sure that nobody could ever go back that way. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible and for your words, Lord. I pray that you would please just um, help us to be founded in your word. And that even when Satan tries to deceive us with, um, with straying or from not believing your word, dear God, that we would remain strong. That one, we would know what you, what you say to us, what, um, what your word says unto us, and that we would stand on that. That we wouldn't be tricked or deceived into questioning your word or believing people when they come to us with lies saying that you, don't, you didn't say what you said. And... Um, Lord, help us not to, to even let sin be an option for us, that we wouldn't look at it um, in a way that, that we would be covetous or um, desirous of, of doing something that would be breaking your commands. God, help us to have that right spirit and to stay strong in your word. And Lord, I pray that you would please just help us to learn more and more every day from the Bible and the, the roles that we need to fill in our lives as men and women, dear God. And... Um, 
Help us to just live a life that's honoring and glorifying unto your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.